for joining the PD Green Program's uh, first webinar of the fall 2021 Justice Education Series. Uh, as some of you know and uh, others don't, uh, my name is Mako Faniel, and uh, at the PD Green Program, I serve as the Director of Tutor Training and Justice Education. So what does that all mean? So uh, I help volunteers learn how to be uh, good tutors and how to, uh, how to do so ethically, all right? Uh, but I'm also responsible for helping volunteers understand uh, the broader logics and, uh, and practices uh, that create mass incarceration and prison education. And I do so by connecting them to the thinkers, activists, writers, and system impacted folks fighting for systemic change, all right? And uh, for tonight, I'm also the moderator for a webinar titled, uh, What About the 30% uh, Education Before College and Prison? Uh, so it looks like uh, tonight uh, we have uh, about uh, 100 people who are virtually gathered uh, with us uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, how we can increase access to high quality education for system involved learners at the pre-collegiate level. So to facilitate learning, uh, we have uh, five, we have four different organizations and five different panelists uh, that are engaged in this work. And they will help us navigate uh, four questions. Uh, so first, uh, what is pre-collegiate education and what are the different types of programs uh, providing it, all right? Secondly, what is high quality education as it relates to pre-collegiate and collegiate education in carceral spaces? Third, uh, what are the barriers and challenges that exist and, uh, and, pre uh, and prevent access to high quality pre-collegiate education? And lastly, how do we go about advocating for pre-collegiate education for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated learners, all right? So to accomplish this, we have a, a, a very quick agenda. Uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, state the occasion which I'm doing right now. I introduce you to our panelists. We'll have a Q&A with our panelists, uh, but then we'll open it up to the audience and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll close out giving you some steps on how we can move forward, all right? So um, in a second, I wanna introduce you to our panelists and get us started with questions. Uh, but first, I want to explain why the PD Green program is even concerned about high quality pre-collegiate education, all right? So most of us know uh, that the PD Green program is the largest or, or organization uh, providing uh, volunteer tutors uh, in multiple states, uh, and we support the educational goals of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated learners, all right? But um, when we were researching uh, to determine the goals for our most recent strategic plan, we were reminded that most of our programming focused on incarcerated learners pursuing either high school equivalency or adult basic education credentials. We also noticed that while many colleges and universities have developed prison-based education programs in recent years, uh, there remains this shortage of high quality programming for roughly uh, thirty percent of the incarcerated learners who don't have a GED or high school diploma, and we also learned that even those with a high school credential often lack the crucial skills that are necessary to succeed in today's workforce and in post-secondary education. So, one way that we decided to address this gap was through piloting three college bridge programs. So, we have one in DC, one in New Jersey and uh, one in Massachusetts. So we piloted, piloted this uh, over the last uh, year. Uh, and this college bridge programs are focused on enhancing the writing skills of incarcerated learners. And we'll be uh, piloting a, a few more that are focused on, uh, on mathematical skills. So we pursued this effort by partnering with facilities and organizations that were already providing a high quality educational pre-collegiate and, and uh, collegiate programs for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated learners. And who also understood that it was necessary to offer bridge programs. So, but we're also concerned about pre-collegiate education because we wanna make sure uh, that system involved learners are getting the educational support that they need to meet their freedom dreams, okay? So if 
uh, of education uh, inside of jails, prisons, and detention centers. Uh, and uh, for formerly incarcerated folks, it's going to exist. Uh, we've learned that this has to be uh, student-centered, uh, and it has to be about the freedom dreams of the students. So we want to make sure that we are engaging in an ethical service, okay? Uh, that, uh, that we are not uh, lending ourselves to more unfreedom uh, for people who are, who are experiencing unfreedom. And we want to have a say in what high quality education program is. Uh, and here's the thing. We have volunteers that are going in, and this is, uh, this is a transformational experience for them. And part of our mission is for, for them to understand not only the injustices manifest in the carceral system, but also be able to uh, join with uh, system impacted people uh, in the efforts to uh, rethink uh, and, uh, and change uh, what our criminal legal system looks like. So we want our volunteers to advocate for high quality education programs that center the freedom of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated learners, all right? So uh, now that we know why we're here, and I know that y'all are tired of hearing me talking uh, uh, this early, I want to introduce you to the people who will facilitate our learning today. All right. So uh, that's my mug right there. I need a new uh, a new headshot. I was uh, like 30 years old then. I, I have I have more age on me now. Uh, but our first panelist is someone who is no stranger uh, to the Justice Education Series, uh, as he served on a panel last fall about approaches to reentry. And so Jeffrey Abramowitz is a writer, a keynote speaker, and lecturer around the country on issues of adult education, workforce development, and criminal justice. Jeff sits on the executive board of the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, uh, where he serves as the chair for literacy behind and beyond the walls committee. And for his day job, Jeff is an executive director of Reentry Services for Jails Human Services and program director for Looking Forward Philadelphia. Uh, Jeff is also a formerly incarcerated uh, person. So our next panelist is uh, Sheila uh, Meeman. Uh, Sheila is the director of Raritan Valley Community College's educational program for returning and incarcerated learners uh, in New Jersey, all right? Um, next, we have two panelists uh, from the Maya Angelou Academy in DC, which provides a safe, um, nurturing and mutually respectful environment that motivates and prepares adjudicated youth to fulfill their academic and career potential. So Christy Webb uh, is a GED instructor and mentor at the Maya Angelou Charter School and Maya Montero is the college and career coordinator at the Maya Angelou um, Ac Academy Charter School. And our last panelist, uh, participated in the educational programming while incarcerated and post-incarceration uh, through uh, NJ Step, And now Robert DeMarco coordinates the efforts of volunteer tutors to support the educational goals of formerly incarcerated students enrolled at Rutgers University. All right. So these five panelists will help us understand the landscape of pre-collegiate education for system-involved people, help us understand what high-quality pre-collegiate pre education looks like, and how we can advocate for it. And so we, if you want to learn more about them, please go to our website uh, at thepdgreenprogram.org. So let's get started, all right? So welcome everybody. Oh, y'all can't hear me. <laughs> welcome panelists, how are y'all doing? Good. Good, good, good. So uh, thank y'all for joining us and uh, for, for hanging out with us tonight. Your, uh, your expertise is uh, very much appreciated. And so um, for my first question, I want to kind of extend uh, beyond your bios. And so I'm hoping that you can introduce yourselves and your organizations. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm concerned about, you know, the story of how you personally got involved in the work of what we call prison education and explain uh, what your organization, how your organization plays, the role that your organization plays in pre-collegiate education for incarcerated, uh, adjudicated youth and formerly incarcerated uh, people. And so uh, I guess we can go ahead and get started with, uh, with Sheila. Thanks, Nico. Um, hi, I'm Sheila Myman. Um, I'm in New Jersey. 
and I'm with a community college in the central part of the state, Raritan Valley Community College. Um, about 2010, 910, that academic year, um, our faculty started looking around and saying, what, what's our mission as a school? And we're a community college. So we asked, what are we doing to serve our community? And when we look around, we realized that there were two facilities, correctional facilities in our sending district. And we said, what are we doing to serve that part of our community? <clears throat> so a set of us started going in and um, teaching inside those local facilities. They were state facilities. Um, one was a youth facility, uh, which is in New Jersey is categorized as 18 to 30-ish, it's not juvenile, and the women's facility. And from our earliest connection with this work, we wanted it to be credited classes, not, there, there always have been lots of good people teaching good things inside, inside prison facilities, lots of volunteers, lots of um, very well-meaning efforts happening. But we're a college. We said, if we're gonna do this, we wanna do this with credit work so that the students who are doing this can have the same credential that our students on campus would. And so we did a lot of talking and thinking about how we did that. And we said, we're not, we're not in the work of charity. Charity is not our business, education's our business. And so if we're gonna do this, we want the classes to be the same inside the facilities as they are outside. There aren't going to be gift grades. <laughs> The assessment at the end is going to look just like the assessment on campus. So in the wonderful future, as we were visioning in, in 09 and, and 10, when people that have been with us inside leave and they come to campus to learn, they can slide right in because they're going to have the same academic preparation and the same expectations. And so we began the work and we began with, um, an awful lot of basic skills work. Um, it's not uncommon for community colleges to have people that have that are a range, a range of learners. Um, we have some people that are day one ready for college work, and other people that need preparation to be um, to be ready. So I'm a math professor, so that was where I connected with this, um, and I think it took one um, one course, and I was pretty much hooked and kept doing it for a number of years. Um, we've always had partners as we've done this work. Um, in the early days, we were partnered with Drew University um, and they, they were doing companion work with us um, and some other schools. And in 2013, we joined with Rutgers and uh, the um, Department of Corrections to form a consortium called NJ Step. And, Raritan Valley offers an associate degree across the state of New Jersey inside the state correctional facilities. And when our students complete, our students have the opportunity inside that same correctional facility to continue in a bachelor's program with Rutgers. Um, our selection early on was to teach a liberal arts degree. Um, and that was a lot of conversation in the early days about what to do. Liberal arts is the most common degree on campus. So we thought that made sense because we couldn't teach everything at once. Um, but a liberal arts degree has an enormous amount of academic flexibility in it. You can take um, things from almost every discipline that's out there and fit it into that degree. So it let people have a chance, even if it was only in the elective space to at least attach themselves to academics that match their passions. So that's how we began. Um, we now, on a, on a steady state basis, have about 500 students a semester that are enrolled in the college program. Um, some of our students completed high school on the outside. Some have worked with our DOC partners, the educators inside DOC, to complete their high school work there. Um, we don't teach people before high school. We teach them after. You have to have a high school credential of some sort to begin with the college. Um, we have a variety of instructional partners across the state right now. Um, Raritan is in one portion of the state and some of the facilities are three hours from us, which is a long way. So we um, have formed wonderful partnerships with other colleges and universities in the state. 
And if they have people who are motivated to do this work and work with these students, um, they can, some, and they work for another college as our, their home school or another university, we take their credentials when they apply, we put them through the same screen that our home faculty is put through. They have to have the same um, ability uh, to be credentialed. And they teach our courses. Um, we manage them. Um, and when they're done, they, we hope they come back. If not, they return back to their home institution to keep teaching. So they basically kind of adjuncts. But 20% of our courses are taught by Princeton University people, for instance. And we have, we have wonderful partners across the state in many of the other schools, in Rowan, in Monmouth, et cetera, um, as well as other community colleges. Um, and we hosted the first cap and gown graduation, college graduation in 2013 in the state of New Jersey with pomp and circumstance playing in the background. And we've had many, many graduations, many commencement ceremonies um, with, you know, the president of the state shaking the hands and, and the caps and gowns. And, and that's a wonderful experience. Um, and our students have gone on to do some amazing stuff. So. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for that. Um, I actually got started, uh, as you know, I got started uh, teaching in um, in prisons in New Jersey through, through NJ STEP um, about seven years ago. So, um, you know, thank you for uh, for the work that you've done to for to, towards that consortium. Uh, Jeff, uh, how did you, uh, you know, uh, get started in this work and what role does, I guess, um, we're, we're going to say co-aid uh, play in no pre-collegiate education. Yeah, sure. So good evening, everybody. So my name is Jeff Abramowitz, and I'm a director of reentry services at Jabs Human Services. Um, it hasn't been that long, um, about four years, but my journey really started um, about 10 years ago. I was um, a lawyer in Philadelphia, practiced in all the state courts and federal courts, and also before the U.S. Supreme Court about 10 years ago, really made some bad choices in life, was handed a federal indictment, took responsibility for it, and went to a federal prison for five years. Uh, they say the two most important days of your life are the day you're born, and a lot of people say the day you die. I would say it's the day you figure out why you're born. And I could tell you that it occurred for me the second that the judge's gavel struck wood because I was taken right into custody and went to a holding cell in FDC Philadelphia, and then was transferred to a secure, um, just below a supermax prison up in upstate Pennsylvania, and realized that there were very little things being done there uh, as far as education. So I began to teach, I mean teach. I taught GED, math, public speaking, business law, anything you could think of, I taught inside of prison walls because um, we did not have very, much being offered at all where I was. And I really found that my passion was in education. And I came home to Philadelphia five years later, it was six years last week, and lived in a shelter, began to navigate my life in North Philadelphia, a really challenging area of our country, and began teaching GED math in a, in a, a adult literacy center. Quickly became director of workforce development, and the train started running really fast after that. Um, began doing reentry work in Philadelphia, took a leadership position with Just Leadership and did a fellowship with them nationally, began speaking around the country, uh, took a position on the Pennsylvania Workforce Development Board, and four and a half years ago was at an event uh, that I was helping to facilitate, and um, I was uh, at, approached by Jeb's Human Services in Philadelphia to be uh, their executive director of reentry services. Now, Jeb's is a big organization. We service about 45,000 people in Philly. We have uh, two methadone clinics, a technical college, a whole bunch of diversion and reentry programs. The same day I got the job from Jeb's, I got a call from COABE, which is the Coalition on Basic Adult Education. And they said, Jeff, we don't do anything behind or beyond the walls when it comes to literacy. Can you help us? And I started the Prison Literacy Commission. And a lot of other things have flowed from that. But in January, I started doing work with the United States Department of Education as a subject matter expert. And... Um, I'm in Washington today meeting with some colleagues and uh, trying to make sure that we do whatever we can to build a stronger, uh, more equitable and fair educational system for the men and women, not only behind our walls, but as they come home. So I wear a different pair of glasses today than I ever have. 
And uh, I'm proud to be sitting at the table, um, in particular for the men and women that I've worked with that are black and brown and marginalized and that have been so impacted by this justice system. That we have. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, um, and for the work you're doing in reentry and uh, this advocacy work that you're doing in DC right now. Uh, next, I guess, can we go to uh, Christy and Maya? Uh, can you all introduce yourselves and uh, how you got into this work and like what specifically does Maya, uh, Maya Angelou uh, do? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Christy Webb. And um, we're here at Maya Angelou Academy. And I guess I'm gonna start from the beginning. Um, Maya Angelou Academy started in 2007. Um, we, I guess are the first school that charter school that wanted to start in a juvenile facility. Um, it was at one point, um, we got the contract and it was one point DY, DCPS um, was here and we decided to take the contract and take it over. So we've been here for about ooh, 14 years. Um, I think we are the only charter school that's in a juvenile facility. And the one thing that I think we bring and I love is basically what um, our goals are and the need for this population and what they need as far as for good education. So here at Meyer, you know, our goal is to provide a safe and nurturing and I guess respectful environment to motivate our scholars. Um, to get you know excited about education, and as you can see, we don't we don't call our um, residents students. We call them scholars because we believe all of them are scholars. Um, and the one thing here, they have small settings. Um, we provide wraparound services for them. Um, we are just we provide I guess a loving and nurturing environment for them. Um, and our purpose is basically to get them to see that to live outside that box that they are that they are in to expose them to different things. Um, and I'm so glad that Maya um, came on about three years ago to provide that um, college career and training that they can be exposed to. Um, we go on college tours pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, we used to sh show them um, go to Lincoln University, UBC, and just to see the expression on some of these young men's face about, wow, I'm on a college campus and yes, I can do this. So our you know, it's just, we decide to try to motivate our scholars to do their best. I know, right? <laughs> Here's Amaya. Yes, um, well, like she said, I'm Maya, and here at Maya Angelou Academy, I'm the college and career coordinator, but also alumni support. So in addition to what we do here is also that transitional piece where when scholars do leave, our facility and leave my Angelou that I still will connect with them. I still work with them to work on their resume, get applications done. We just had a scholar who left us who got into Bowie State University. And so with that, that means me helping him move in, connecting with, making sure that he connects with the right resources so that even though, you know, they get in and they might get a job or do applications, but we don't want to leave them hanging. So we know that the most intricate part is when they go back to their community. So that's why our role is very intricate. And outside of me, they have advocates, they have people who connect with them to make sure that once they leave our walls, it's not over. It's not that, okay, we're done, but we actually care about them, we support them, and that they built so much trust and rapport with us that now that's what we then continue into their community to make sure that they are successful and that it doesn't leave here. Thank you very much for that, Christy and Maya. Um, and last, we'll go with, with Robert, uh, who is of kind of uh, come full circle uh, in uh, in this. Uh, how'd you get involved, and like, what role are you playing right now? Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here, and um, forgive the frog in my throat as I'm still a little under the weather. But um, yeah, as Mako said, I am working with PD Green program as a um, College Bridge coordinator um in the new jersey um, on a Mellon, Mellon fellowship yeah uh, many ads um what got me there was um being incarcerated in southwood state prison um i heard about the new jersey step program and i figured you know since i'm in here let me make some positive out of this out of this negative situation so i signed up 
uh, to become a member of the New Jersey STEP program. And um, I would just like to say um, much to what Sheila spoke to um, and some of the others like Raritan Valley, certainly, and NJ STEP as a whole has 100% risen to the occasion when it comes to challenging the learners and not only challenging them, but making them realize, hey, I can do this. Like, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the learners in prison never even pictured themselves in a college classroom. And the fact that it could be delivered was just um that they certainly rose to that occasion. So my hat is off to them. I'm eternally grateful to them. Um and in that sense of gratitude, I always wanted to give back. I became a tutor um for the GED program at Southwoods. Um upon my transition to the halfway house, I became a member of the um Mountain View community as I was working on my bachelor's degree. Um, I chose social work um, because it, it's just a great way of giving, great profession to give back. Um, and that led to a summer um, summer program with Princeton, the Prison Teaching Initiative, uh, where I did a research project um, for some of the teachers who actually go in to the prisons and just gave them like a little bit of information on how to best approach it. Um, you know, approaching it as just something beyond the academic service you're providing. You're really providing many other services by default. You know, it's <clears throat> almost a therapeutic intervention. It's a revolutionary intervention because we're really working to, you know, address mass incarceration as a whole through education, which is one of the most proven interventions when it comes to um, ending recidivism and um, reducing crime. So that all led to, you know, PD Green. And when I heard about it, I thought it was an excellent way for me to give back as I continue to try and give back and just help programs like New Jersey Step expand and, you know, become more available to the people who are interested in them. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly humbled and grateful to be here and part of this panel. And, um, I just, I just hope to be able to, you know, pay it forward as, as Megan said, that it's definitely, I've come full circle because so many have been there to help me. So yeah. I'm honored. Cool. Thank you very much, Robert. And we're honored to have you. Uh, so uh, thank you all for those introductions uh, of, of, of yourselves, but also your organizations. And uh, I kind of want to um, uh, kind of extend on that. And I have a long, uh, kind of a, uh, a, a long setup for this question, but I think it's important to uh, understand the context of where I'm going. And so, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the PD Green program, you know, entered this part of prison education uh, as an organization that uh, for about 12 years was primarily uh, supported learners pursuing high school equivalency credentials, and while also supporting learners uh, enrolled in college and prison programs. So working with learners and partners on both sides, we learned that uh, the elevation of higher education in prison um, uh, programming underscored the need for high quality pre-collegiate education. So including uh, college bridge programs. Uh, so this is so because several reports indicated that system involved learners, uh, just like learners with no involvement with the confining arms of the cr uh, criminal legal system, but even more so because of their system impactedness, had very low literacy and numerical skills. Uh, and the, these are necessary for success in college. So pause for a second. Uh, I, I, I chose these words uh, on purpose. So educators across the uh, nation, that uh, college and, um, and community college uh, know that uh, many learners uh, whether system impacted or not, are coming to college, uh, not what we call college ready, okay? The evidence in that is in what middle school programs are doing, what, K, what other K-12 programs are doing. And so this is not unique to system impacted learners, but uh, the system impactedness compounds what uh, is, 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 uh, is not helping uh, to prepare folks for college. Uh, and that, that point must be made uh, because uh, uh, we are not here to do any further stigmatization uh, on folks, all right? So 
Um, so the reasons for these gaps are like are many. Uh, so including missed opportunities during uh, prior K-12 schooling, undiagnosed learning disabilities, et cetera. All right. So we choose not to locate these gaps in individual failure because we believe that everyone deserves a chance and that we, that we cannot discount anyone and that we have a role to play in bridging these gaps. And so in the last year, in a partnering with, uh, with programs in DC, Massachusetts, and Jersey, to develop college bridge programming, we learned a couple of things. So we, we learned that the need for college readiness programs is actually acutely perceived by the students themselves. Uh, who were eager uh, to work on their writing and excited to uh, work on engaging texts. Uh, at the same time, we have found that in addition to a need to strengthen academic skills, there's also a need to strengthen students' confidence, all right? So many of the panelists have already talked about this. Um, many students are convinced that uh, they are just not good writers, and one of the goals of our College Bridge writing program is to change this perception. So anyone who teaches college, uh, particularly of uh, uh, freshman year uh, writing, uh, knows that all learners uh, come in with this idea that there is uh, that there is something uh, that that's called a good writer. All right. Uh, again, system impactedness uh, is is uh, compounding this. All right. Uh, so to do so, it's crucial that uh, that we establish a human connection uh, to build strong pedagogical relationships that can motivate and encourage students. And really, uh, we are engaged and we have a trauma-informed approach to our pedagogy. We're going through trauma-informed uh, uh, training and we do some trauma-informed work uh, uh, with, with our students, all right? So I set that up uh, for, the, uh, for the panelists and provided that background because I'm hoping that each of you can talk about, uh, you know, the problems or challenges that your organization was trying to solve or mitigate by providing pre-collegiate educational programs for system involved people, you know, or to put more simply, because I'm, I'm, I'm a, a verbose person is, you know, well, why did your organization begin uh, like actually doing this work? And uh, I guess we'll, we can start with, uh, uh, with Christy and, uh, and Maya. Mm -hmm. I think, the, hello everyone again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the one thing that we realized and what our organization realized, it was a need. Um, I think when we kind of focus on like only one in 10 scholars who have been adjudicated delinquents will go to high school, even go to college. And we wanted to change that statistic. Um, and we wanted to provide them with a quality, quality education um, and kind of follow under these guidelines. Um, one thing that we follow is we, academic rigor is important here. You know, we set our standards high um, for our scholars. Um, we don't lower expectations. Um, we, you know, we use scholar accountability. We hold them accountable for every action that they do. Um, and we also provide that environment for them to feel safe and to express themselves. And we're very transparent here. Um, I think that sometimes our scholars who the average age is from 16 to 18, um, when we give them assessments and we say, okay, you're 18 years old, but you're reading at this level and you need to get here. Um, and I think that's important. Um, we provide resources. We provide, we have a bundle of resources they, they can use and we want to expose them to you no know, education and things on a daily basis. Yeah. Also with the college coordinator, we provide um, speakers to come in um, to talk to them. Um, pre-COVID and even during the COVID, we had we Skype people in um, to talk to them and motivate them and provide them with all the resources that they do have in DC when they leave. And also to add to that too, we do a lot of social um, and emotional learning and we incorporate that with our learning process and just part of the curriculum as well. And to highlight them on the different, so social and emotional um, skills that they do have. So that, because one, we know that a lot of our kids come from communities where they will be challenged, you know, and it, it does come with different barriers and circumstances that they don't necessarily have to manage here because they are safe. They have all the support, but when they go back to the community, it's not always, it doesn't always exist. 
So that social and emotional piece is very huge in terms of incorporating it into the curriculum and then also relating the educational piece to real life so that it's not just so then also with them they get some experience but also when it's relatable they're more engaged and then that pulls them in more to want to learn and building their confidence is like a huge piece of that because a lot of them will have these negative connotations that I can't do it or I'm not good enough or things that they've either heard or believe and so building that confidence in with having teachers continuously motivate them is very helpful for them with on top of their academic rigor. Yeah, thank you for that, Christy. And my, uh, I, uh, I mean, shit, I, I wish I would have had that uh, in, in my in my high school that uh, <laughs> so for several reasons. But I think you know we, we're not here yet. But I uh, I think that uh, uh, we're getting some in indication of what high quality looks like. Uh, you know that we have to that it has to be safe. Uh, that the, that the same uh, you know rigor that we are uh, that we expect of. Uh, uh, quote-unquote traditional college students or traditional high school students uh, we're expecting of these system impacted of uh, learners that we're providing resources that that college and community and so this seems like it's built around uh, the uh, the freedoms uh, uh, for uh, for the folk that actually uh, are, are, are impacted and will take advantage of this um, I, I, before I move on I want to I, I want to kind of get at something because there seems to be like some deliberateness uh, uh, around what you all are doing, and uh, uh, you know, we 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 considered having uh, you know David uh, as one of the panelists, but we decided like to to uh, to, to go against that. But can y'all talk? Just talk. I mean, not it wasn't. <laughs> no, no, I mean it was it was uh, it, it's better that 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 you all are, are, are here, but. Uh, can you all talk a little bit about the like the, the deliberateness of you know this choice of of, of of language around like scholars and this deliberateness around you know not you know of of of, uh, of not employing what we call cross humanism or like these these uh, these punitive and uh, um, like measures to, uh, to 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 education can yeah I think the one thing is that. You know, many of our scholars, um, they, I can imagine the trauma that they've been through. And the last thing that they're, they're thinking about is education. And we want to break that. Like, we, we want to kind of put in them, like, you are important. Um, and you can do the Pythagorean theorem. You know, you can get your high school diploma or GED. Um, and the thing is, they have so much self-doubt when they come, when they enter uh, Maya Angelou Academy. And we want to build them up. From where they are. Um, and the one thing that we do, we have award ceremony every month. And to see one of our scholars who never won anything walk up to the um, podium and get an award for the most improved in math and that smile on their face. Um, the little small rewards that we can do just kind of builds them up and then they put more effort into that education because the self-doubt here is, is, is just, is, is heartbreaking, but when we see the small little rewards that they can do in class, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's like a light bulb is, um, goes off. And I'm like, look, wow, I should have been to school because I can do this work when they put forth effort. Um, we want to motivate. Um, we want them to feel important. So that is our main focus is to kind of push them to the limit, you know, push them where nobody even gave them a chance to because they are important and they can do um, what any other average or other um, student other situations can do and when you build that up it's amazing yeah thank you thank you uh sheila oh, maya did you have something else i was just gonna yeah i was gonna add um because a big part of this too is building that rapport too that trust and that rapport and like miss webb said it's that it's that positivity like that unconditional positive regard because precisely why they're here in a juvenile facility is because something negative that they did. So a lot of times when they come into this facility, everything is negative. Everything, they're getting consequences. They're always getting in trouble or they have like point systems and all these other things that hold them back from going home. So the one thing that we highlight a lot is that positivity. And boosting up their confidence is a huge aspect of getting our kids to actually want to learn because a lot of times, what 
you find, and especially what I've noticed working here is that a lot, even in this position, you, it's hard to get a kid to want to learn, but a lot of times when they have rapport with you and they really, really care about, and they, they know that you care about them, they will do it for you. And that's the first step. But then after that, once they're like, you know what, I know this person trusts me. I know this person supports me. I know this person is here for me. I will do it because I know it's going to be a disappointment to them. But then after, when they know that when they make a mistake or something happens and you don't give up on them, that's when it switches from you to them. Mm-hmm. When they then look at themselves and like, no, I know I can do that. Mm-hmm. And we do that all the time. And for me, we have like mock interviews and people from outside will come in and do mock interviews for them. But even today, earlier today, mm-hmm. we had a student who did it and he's leaving on Friday and has a job on Monday. So he came from not even knowing and believing in himself to now in two months getting what he has his last test on Friday Friday. for the GED and it's in now a job on Monday. So that's what we do it for. But also it's building his confidence to get to that point. Because when he first came here, that was not, he was stubborn. He was against (laughs) everything. And now he knows that we, we work with him and we want him to succeed. So that changed his whole perspective. And now he's, he has potential and will leave not just leaving like, okay, I'm done with the program, but with his GED. And then also there's new things and opportunities waiting for him when he goes home. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Sheila, what, what were, um, you know, I know Raritan Valley uh, was, uh, you know, is a community college, uh, saw, um, you know, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated uh, folks as part of the community, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more about like, uh, like why you all uh, like, you know, saw this as necessary in New Jersey? Well, I mean, if you are going to serve a community, you're going to need to serve all of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when we first started this work, we weren't sure what to expect. There weren't a lot of people playing in that field mm-hmm. um, for us to learn from at that point. but. When we walked in those classrooms, the students were the same. Mm -hmm. Community colleges are open enrollment institutions. And if if you don't know what that means, you you, you apply because we need to know your name and your birth date and things like that. But we don't select or reject people who apply. We're we're, um, probably the most democratic educational institution, any community colleges because of that. But that also means we see people at all ends of the spectrum entering our school. And we see the same inside. There are some students who need no developmental work. And we, we find that out by doing an assessment. And we're, we're becoming more mature as the whole education industry is about doing assessments and looking at multiple measures. Um, some students, come in, um, they're fragile academically. And that makes them really fragile um, confidence-wise and emotionally. And our job is to almost become diagnosticians. Um, Again, I'm a math professor, so half of my examples have to be math because that's what I know best. Um, But if you had the flu, when you were in third grade and you were out for four weeks or you had a family event that kept you out of school or something happened in your life that kept you out of school and you missed a chunk of learning. You got put back in and you may never have been able to catch up after that because everything that the class was learning was built upon that chunk you were missing. And so our job as educators with students who are educationally fragile like that is to go back and diagnose what was missing. Where are you at? And it's amazing. um, To see the progress when a student sees a light bulb going off on something they'd always missed. And then you go back and you put the building blocks on top of it so they've got a trajectory and they can launch. And again, this is, this is a business we do on campus all the time with students. It's, it's, um, and it's actually sort of a thrill as a teacher to 
finally see that light bulb go off and, and finally see somebody gain some self-confidence and see some success. Um, one of the ways that we talk to students who are placed in developmental coursework, which is what we call coursework that is pre-collegiate, um, is that it's a safe space. Um, if you were placed immediately in college work and you weren't prepared for it, it probably wouldn't turn out very well. And that would hit your GPA forever. But developmental coursework is not accumulated in a GPA. So it's safe. If you have trouble, if you need to repeat it twice, it's not hurting your GPA at all. And giving people an understanding that it is a safe space to be vulnerable and to learn those skills that nobody was able to give you way early on um, or even figure out why you couldn't learn, um, I think is helpful for students. Um, so many students that were never able to go back and do that, find that reparative work, um, reparative knowledge that they were missing, they think they're dumb. They come to you and say, I'm dumb, I can't do this. And when they realize it's not anything to do with intellect, it's about, again, diagnosing what wasn't there and wasn't provided to them. And when you look at populations inside prisons, I think a much higher percentage of people who end up in prison were not served very well by the educational system when they were on the outside. They didn't have the same opportunities that many other people do. And so they, they get this self-identification as, yeah, I couldn't do that. I'm not very smart. I never was good in school. I mean, how often do you guys hear that? Never was good in school, right? Um, and, and you have to make sure you're listening very carefully because um, it usually isn't, I didn't like school. It's, I wasn't any good at it. And our educational system tends to give up on people that are struggling as they put those building blocks on. We just, we sort of push them to the side and they go in resource rooms, right? Um, I've had people tell me that I spent four years in high school math on the outside. And what we did was count candy and make a graph out of it for four years straight. That's all the math we ever did. And so um, I think it's, it's helping people understand that it simply is some reparative work that needs to be done. It's nothing to do with their character or their intellect. It's simply the opportunity they were given. And um, at the same time, make sure you've got layers of that work available because not everybody has the same on-ramp. It depends on somebody's skill. You don't wanna take some students don't need any reparative work and they're ready to fly. Um, I know teaching inside, um, one of the first semesters, I probably second semester or third semester I was teaching inside, I gave a final exam and it was the same final I was using on campus, exact same one. And I've been teaching for a while and nobody gets a hundred on my final. I'm not the easiest teacher out there, I admit it. I'm, I'm pretty demanding. Nobody gets a hundred. Two people in my class got a hundred. And mind you, no calculators, no computers, no support. I'm going like, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, simply brilliant students that we've had inside. But I also see students who started in that super developmental level who get the same brilliance when they start college work because they now have a solid foundation they're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were talking, Sheila, I, um, you may even think back to like 23 years ago, um, I think I was actually in the College Bridge program. Um, I graduated high school and seven days later I started, I, I had to go to college to, uh, 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 to build uh, some better math skills and um, in order for me to get like full admittance. And this is a well, like one of the most well resourced uh, in, uh, universities in the world. But I just, you just uh, like connected some dots for me. Um, I wanna, um, Robert, I'm gonna come back to you and uh, well, uh, I'm going to ask you another question in a second, but I want to uh, shift to Jeff. Uh, so Jeff, you and I were, uh, were talking a few days ago uh, and um, about high school equivalency and adult basic education uh, looks like on the inside and for reentry across the nation. 
So uh, before our conversation, like I knew that uh, that jails, prisons, and detention centers were a matter of like federal, state, or municipal control, uh, and uh, that they have different priorities. Uh, but it didn't hit me until we were talking uh, that uh, how this difference impacted access to and quality of high school equivalency uh, and adult basic education. So can you talk to us about uh, the challenge to access and uniformity, uh, including like uh, bureaucracies that exist at the federal and state levels that currently prevent a coordinated and collaborative effort? Sure, so that's a big question and there's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. But first thing I should forewarn everyone that when I went to prison, I lost my filter. So I'm gonna be brutally honest with you because it's the only way I know to be right now. But we have 60, we have 600, thousand plus people come home every year from prison across our country, 670 to 700,000 and even more now COVID's out. And what's going on behind the walls and preparing people where we have a captive audience is a total disgrace. Why is it that we don't have digital literacy in every single prison in our entire country? Why is it that we're not teaching them those basic skills they need to survive when they come home? And the reality is that of those men and women that are coming home, not everyone is ready or wants to go to college or can go to college. And it's not a matter of them not having the educational background. They may not be ready to go there yet. They may just, you know, you come home from prison and prison is a trauma. You come home and you want to get your life together. You have a parole officer sitting on your back saying, we want you to work, get back to work, go feed your family, get a job, get right, right? And the reality in our country is tragically 49% of every single person that's behind the walls today is there on a technical violation, a supervised violation. Now think about that. And why does it happen? It's because we put these mandates on people and we tell them, you know what, you got to get your GED. You got to get your high school equivalency in order to go home. Or when you come home, you got three months or six months to get it. And the challenge is that you know, we have statistically 60% of our prison population have a substance abuse disorder. 39% have some kind of diagnosed mental or behavioral health illness, and that's 44% in our jails. The reality is that people may not have the cognitive ability to get, um, to get, to get the, that high school equivalency. They may not be ready, and that's okay, you know, but they, they need to know that there's an alternative. When you come home uh, from prison, there's so many barriers that you have to jump over in order to get your life right, that you're right. Um, Christy said it best, education's not at the top of their ladder right now. Feeding their family is, paying their fines, staying home is, is, is the top of their ladder. Going back in the classroom isn't necessarily there right there. But then there are other things we can do. And that's why what PD Green does and what your tutors do is so important is because men and women need to go back and sometimes they need that training in order to get those better jobs, right? They need to get that certification so they can be a welder, so they can get their CDL license, so they can be successful in whatever trade they want to do. And we need tutors in order to be able to do that, to bridge that, to give them that, that upskilling, that math and reading support to get them to that next level. And be mindful, you know, I, I'm really, you know, I was a director at an adult literacy agency and extremely mindful of the challenges that our men and women face when they come home. And I remember a young man came in and he was, um, some of the staff came in and said, Mr. A, can you go talk to John? He really, he kind of smells really bad. And um, I said, well, how's he doing? Yeah, he's doing great, his grades are all good. I called him in, I said, John, what's going on? And he said, um, well, I'm doing good in my classes. I said, no, no, what's going on? How you doing? And he said, well, Mr. A, honestly, I got three kids at home and I'm just struggling to feed them. So I'm working three jobs, but I'm making it to class every day by nine o'clock but my, my overnight job doesn't get off till eight o'clock. So I can't shower. Now he's working in a meat packing plant, okay? He's not smelling real good when he walks into that classroom. But, but for the fact that we asked that question, we would have never known. And those are the challenges that men and women have. We as educators and as tutors and anyone in this space need to ask those questions. We need to be wearing the glasses of the men and women that sit in front of us. And we need to say, how can we support you? because it is not about just getting a job and it's not about getting a degree. It's about navigating life. It's all those other things that stand in the way. Do you know what I stock in my office and all my offices I have? I stock diapers. I stock women's feminine products. I stock things like, art, like work boots and things that people need like hygiene stuff. 
I mean, those are things that, you know, that help people persist. And so I know this is going a little off your question, but the reality is that there is a disconnect across the country. The states across our country all run their own systems, many in the Department of Education or the DOCs, and there is no accountability whatsoever, and there is no uniform system. We had this discussion here in Washington today. The federal system is 1%, 1.5% of our entire prison population in, in the country. It's so small. We have 2 million plus people incarcerated in our country. That's the target. It's in the states and the jails. And I think that's where we need to do. We need a unifying system to really hold our educators behind the walls and people that are coming home accountable for the work that's being done and really look at how we can be doing it better. Why we don't connect people behind the walls to places like Christy has and to Maya Angelou and all the other work that's going out before they leave a prison is beyond me. Like, give them a piece of paper. This is where you're going when you leave. Because otherwise, they walk out that door, they fall into this fast-flowing water that takes them back to the neighborhoods where they were that got them in trouble to begin with. So, sorry, that's my long answer. Uh, no problem, Jeff. So, so what opportunities do you, do you see to expand, like, access to high-quality adult education uh, for people inside and outside? You know, you're in Washington right now. Like, what, what, what are you all, like, what are you talking about? So we're talking about funding. We're talking about making sure that you have the resources and tools you need. We're talking about getting, getting mandates at the states to use CARES Act funding and infrastructure funding. I had arguments all day long today. We're about to see the largest infrastructure bill our country has ever seen. And you know what? The men and women that need this bill most, the ones that all these jobs are being created for, they don't have the education, the, the math or literacy in order to do those jobs. So we have to incorporate education into that bill and make it a key component so that we can get the men and women behind our walls and those that have come out that are justice involved into those jobs. And that's what I'm doing here in Washington. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll come back. So Robert, uh, you know, what is, in your uh, experience, what is a high quality uh, college readiness program look like uh, to you? Like what, what does that look like? Well, I would say it's certainly something that has to be comprehensive and multidimensional. Um, it, in my mind, you know, social work buys, it looks a lot like a therapeutic or like a planned change relationship. Um, something, you know, that we would learn like in the generalist intervention model, which is kind of just a roadmap for having, you know, a client um, therapist or a social worker relationship. Um, and it starts with rapport building. It starts with just getting to know uh, some of these students. Um, in a sense, you know, beyond just, hey, you know, just a student, I want to know who you are as a person, you know, like, um, imagine how much of a shock that is when, like, some kind of staff member wants to know about your day, rather than, you know, the the just business when it comes to, you know, usual staff um, and system impacted person interactions. Um, it also, it, it involves meeting students where they are, you know, figuring out what their needs are academically. And not just academically, um, personally, uh, environmentally, um, a plan that's made with the students, um, not for, not necessarily for the students. You know, like it, it's a it's a collaborative endeavor, something that um, it, it's a partnership. It's something that um, you both work on together. Um, you know, willingness to evaluate um, an intervention and recalibrate it if it's not working, uh, you know, the way it should. Um, it's trauma informed when it needs to be, um, as prison and, and the events that led people to prison can be and are traumatic. Um, it focuses on the learning environment, you know, the, the everyday things that um, the student has to go through. And, um, and as others spoke to accountability, um, it's holding the students accountable, but also the, um, you know, the, the deliverers of that education accountable to maintaining those standards and treating the students, you know, like, like someone said, no gift grades. So, um, yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so in what ways do you, where, where, uh, where you will, where you, where, where you prepare for secondary education? Well, for me, um, the funny thing was that I kind of had the, I was there academically, but when it came to like my environment, that was another story. And, um, 
and and that's the thing. I'm the point I'm trying to make. It, it's there's so many dimensions to it. It's not just the academics. It, it's the person's environment, their readiness to you know, um, you know, their place in the world. Um, Cosbridge programs, um, you know, that be you know they have to go beyond academic. They have to consider the environment. Um, you know, prison, whether you're in prison or, or out of prison, some kind of system impact on that can be a distraction. And um, how many people have been discouraged um, growing up, you know, in school, told, hey, you're never going to be anything or uh, you can't do anything like this. Um, schools have failed. Um, people like take your leave. Schools are funded by, you know, property taxes. Well, if the properties aren't worth anything, you know, like in certain areas, like there's so much to consider but um so like yeah mainly you gotta focus you gotta look at the whole environment the person and their environment not just you know where they're at academically um and that's kind of what i think i would have benefited more from like when i like initially began college as a much younger man um you know i had the academics but just uh, mentally i wasn't there you know like i and and that that's it's crucial Thank you. Uh, so, Sheila, from your from your standpoint, is there a pipeline issue? And so, when I when I ask this, is that we have these uh, college and prison programs, uh, and uh, but not much attention on uh, on what we're on the pre collegiate. And so, is there is there a pipeline issue right now? Um, or will there be a pipeline issue? Well, I, I think there is an enormous amount of opportunity okay. at all the different levels. I think um, we always have waiting lists for people who want to join college programs. Um, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about um, how to make sure that people who begin are able to end, mm -hmm. are able to complete, um, and why people drop out who draw why do, why do some people stop what what causes that and what can we do to fix that um i think some of the things that are important to keep in place are the mentoring relationship that a faculty member has with a student um education is not just about the um the spewing of knowledge it's it's educating the whole person it's um, having the relationship, making sure that, that you've got that um, human appreciation um, for the student and that the student has access. Um, as students mature, they become questioning scholars. They question. And the more mature they are educationally and scholastically, the more deeply they question. And they need to have access to faculty that feels safe having questions asked, you may not always know the answer to, mm -hmm. and that you are comfortable with exploring with the more mature student. Um, I think um, we have to be sure that when the, that students who begin their education inside know that the place educating them is going to welcome them on campus when they leave. Um, a personal hot button for me is when colleges are willing to work inside with students, but then say, oh, but you can't come to campus. Mm -hmm. And I've, I, that, that happens more than you think. And I, I, I find that highly offensive, mm -hmm. um, personally. Um, you know, when a person is released, they shouldn't have to reapply to the college they're already a student at. They're already a student. You know, there's, it's just unconscionable to not have, a, have a, a plan to allow them to fold back in or to work with them in this space they go home to, because not everybody goes home close to the college they were in while they were inside. Right. Um, you know that every state, um, prisons are across every state, and a person may bounce from one to another, and they may go home to a place that's not near where they were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And so I think the college working with them inside has, it, it's incumbent upon that college to make sure that they're working with a college near where that student is going home to, to transition if the student wants to. Yeah. So they, that they have the choice of that. 
Um, I think it's really important with developmental education to think about on-ramps and off-ramps. Um, when I think about educational off-ramps, if a person's passion is to become a poet, they, they may need a different package of developmental or pre-college work than a student who was passionate to become an engineer. Um, on campus um, and in, inside, um, again, we have multiple tiers of developmental. And if your passion is to be um, somebody in the liberal arts, you may not need to be really good at managing rational expressions in pre-calc. And so you may not need the highest level of math developmental work. Um, but if that, if your passion is to be an engineer, you're going to need that. And so it's making sure that it's tuned to the person's planned off-ramp, um, as well as respecting their on-ramp where they were when they entered. Um, I think we, from a high quality perspective, um, the places that I've not seen many programs do well are dealing with ESL students. Um, and, and, you know, how awful is it to take somebody who's barely able to speak English and immediately start teaching them in English? You know, there has to be, there, there needs to be a much better support for students who start out speaking and are comfortable speaking a language that's not the language that the course is being offered in. And I think that bridge is very shaky in most programs. Um, I think basic literacy is not always being addressed in most programs. Um, we like to think that when somebody gets a high school equivalency or gets out of high school, that they, they've achieved a certain level. And we all know that that's not necessarily true. Um, and there needs to be more support even than a, than a college developmental program can give when somebody has basic literacy needs. Um, and I think we've got a gap in that in, in almost every program I know of. And again, student may be motivated, may care, may, may be trying, but if their basic literacy is so low or they have a completely strong language barrier, it, it makes a mountain for them to have to climb. And they may not be able to, 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 to go over that mountain without a different level of support. Um, so I think programs have to think about where their students are at and I think the work has to be culturally sensitive to. Um, when you look at textbooks, textbooks are not always culturally sensitive uh, to students. Um, and so... Um, they're, all, they're all made in my home state. Yeah? Texas. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it... Um, but... You have to um, you have to give students a, an environment too. I think if you want to keep your pipeline rolling in your classroom, that is a classroom. Um, I can't tell you how often I hear students talk about the fact that the classroom is their time that they're free mm -hmm. when they're inside, and we need to maintain that um, by um, taking them out of the, culture, the carceral mindset that they're in and bringing them into an academic mindset and, um, and letting them have that freedom to learn and appreciate even though they're in a space that is um, not so free. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. So I wanna get four questions in before we go to the audience. So I wanna try to do this in five minutes. And so the, uh, this goes to, uh, to Christy. So, how does what like Maya Angelou is doing uh, with system involved youth like differ then from what uh, is happening in other jurisdictions or in other cities? I mean, you said that this is kind of like the only charter school that's doing this, and so how does how, how does it differ? What uh, I guess the the experience for like the the young person like how does how does it differ? Um. I think the one thing that's different is the amount of support that we have. Mm -hmm. um, when a scholar enters uh, Maya Angelou Academy, they have a student advocate, they have a school psychologist, they have uh, the um, social worker, um, they have teachers, they're in a small 
uh, class environment, no more than 10. In the classroom, they have, we do co-teaching. We have general ed and special ed um, um, teacher in the classroom. Um, we have CTE. Uh, we, of course, we have the wonderful GED program. <laughs> um, and we, uh, we just provide so many resources where we don't focus on what they did. We focus on the education piece and see what they can do as far as with growth. Um, like I said before, we go on college tours and um, we provide them with things that normally um, they wouldn't even think about doing. Um, we uh, also have, like I said, the award ceremony every month. Um, we, we promote as far as with the um, college, um, the college career education part that we just adopted, what, four or five years mm -hmm. ago. And to see the interest in it, their change within three months, just like the scholar um, Ms. Maya was talking about, the expression on his face today, because we had a um, job um, interview and mock interviews to prepare them. I mean, he's, he has one more part to pass in the uh, GED, and then he leaves, what, Friday, and then he has a job on Monday. Um, and, you know, we provide just so many resources um, for these scholars as soon as they step foot in our building. That makes sense. Um, I guess, uh, uh, Robert and Jeff, if you can answer this quickly, uh, how can we create uh, like a continuum of educational opportunities, like from high school and our GED to college, from jails to prisons to halfway houses, and ultimately re reentry settings? Like, how can we get basically, like, how can we get everybody on the same page uh, uh, um, when it comes to like education? Get everybody to the table. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to sit at the table. Um, you know, we all have to be there. The colleges need to be sitting next to the the, um, the, the Christy Webbs, and they need to be sitting next to the reentry organizations, and they need to be sitting next to the PD Greens, and they all need to be at the table, and they have to talk about, and, and the prison facilities, and they all have to be there saying, look, this is the handoff. It starts behind the walls and continues when it comes out. But without everybody at the table, it makes it really challenging because we all end up working in these silos. And that's where the trouble happens. I'd like to echo what Jeffrey said. Um, just, yeah, building stakeholdership. Um, you know, letting, you know, getting the people who wouldn't otherwise be for, you know, people in prison going to college, you know, get them behind movements like this because this is the one thing that, really works uh, getting the prisons to admit that is huge you know like there may be some you know people there may be careers on the line like you know by saying hey all these programs that were in place you know aren't really as you know effective as you know some real college education that's available to everybody um it, it starts with you know humanizing prisoners you know undoing stigmas um undoing decades <laughs> of you know oppression um it, it, it's gonna take a lot it's no small task but yeah it, it like Jeff said, it begins with getting everyone on the same page. Cool. So I want to do a round robin real quick. Uh, one answer. Um, like you're sitting in front, you have the ear of a policymaker, uh, if you're a, le you're a legislator, people in your municipality. Like what do we need and what do we what do we need to be advocating for? Like what is what does policy change look like in order for uh, for us to get this right on behalf of you know uh, the students? So what how, what do we need to be advocating for? Anybody can start. I mean, I can tell you what I'm advocating for. I mean, I'm advocating for for states to be held accountable for what's going on behind the walls. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going through COVID-19 right now, and I know it's challenging. I know facilities are having trouble inside, but I asked a question the other day. To a room full of again a keynote address to some correctional educators i said how many facilities and there were a lot of facilities in the room have a you know how many facilities here have a ventilator in their facility and um you know men and women are living in a petri dish inside of our walls and and, and that's and i get it you know vaccines are now starting to hit inside but it doesn't mean everything else should stop you know we we still have to prepare people for when they're coming home right so we still have to get our education classes back open again. We got to get all those programs back open again. We got to start teaching them again. So the question, the answer really is we got to hold people accountable at a state and federal level for what's happening in our prisons 
And for the longest time, they haven't been. They've been able to well, to stay behind their walls and keep whatever's going on going on back there. And that's got to change. And it's got to change with our education and skill training programs. Thank you, Jeff. If ever there was a time for allowing prisoners access to digital technology and computers and, and learning healthy, it's now with all the virtual schooling and education going on. I would push the legislators, hey, please allow, you know, prisoners access. I'm not talking about those corrupt JPA tablets and that whole system. I mean, like, let prisoners join the 21st century because you're going to be expected to know how to use this technology and education could be a part, of, you know, a good shoehorn to get them into the prisons. Or what we, what we, what we call blended learning. So digital and uh and uh, hybrid and, 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 yep. and, uh, and hybrid and and, and whatever you want to call it with in person yeah yeah if ever there's a time it's now yeah sheila um i agree with the hybrid learning and access to technology i'm not a fan of replacing real teachers with technology but augmenting teaching teachers with technology is awesome and and we need that to be more universally available um some things it's hard to have states rule on because it creates such inequity for people depending on what state they're in. Um, and I think I also would like to see, um, and a lot of that conversation's happening this week, more equity in the financial aid arena. I've spent the last number of years advocating for the return of Pell and for the return of state aid. Um, but I worry because the way it's implemented could still restrict people. I know in New Jersey, um, even if a person can't get financial aid, our college is paying for their, their, their education. We don't exclude anyone because of the ability to pay. But all across this country, in Second Chance Pell programs, you'll find some that if a person can't get Pell, they can't get educated. And if someone doesn't have access to the Social Security number because they have been in foster care since they were seven years old, we're going to exclude them from education. That's just wrong. And I think we need to fix some of that at the federal level. Thank you, Sheila. And just, just to, uh, to say this, the PD Green program does not advocate uh, replacing uh, uh, of educators <laughs> or a digital only. Uh, we are uh, advocating for uh, blended learning. Uh, we've learned that from the, from, from the work that we've done in a year. And so I think we need to have a webinar on that, <laughs> uh, what we've learned so far. Uh, Christy and Maya, uh, and then uh, then we'll go to the uh, audience. And so, Policy. And just to add to what everybody said, I think, yes, having everyone at the table, yes, educating everybody that are in um, different facilities, whether juvenile, detention, jail, or prison, and not substituting teachers with virtual learning at all. But also I think another part to that is not letting it stop at these walls and in these facilities because it is that idle time when people go home. And that's when it is that environmental factor that comes in more than ever. It is that survival mode. It is trying to figure out what, what am I gonna do with my life? So I think having these supports like we do here in these facilities and trying to push education is just as important with having programs like this specifically for incarcerated adults, youth, within the community so that it's not just in the facilities, but then they know that they're supported in the community when it matters the most so that they can become successful because we can only do so, so much here and everything else is kind of beyond our control as educators. So then actually being in the community to do more and to be present, because I think that that's very much so lacking, especially in our underprivileged communities. So Robert and uh, Jeff, one, uh, you have less than a minute to answer this. You have the most experience to this. Uh, most of our audience tonight are PD Green Program volunteers. Uh, like what role do they play uh, in providing high quality education and, or, and, and even advocates? I mean, their role is key. They, they need to understand the value of what they bring to the table, which is they're really providing um, an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one guided attention to really things that um, can be really challenging for some people and having the patience to work through those with people um, can change a life. And if you can just help somebody get through a math, you know, pass that math exam or be able to read a little bit better, um, 
you know, you're not just doing this for a test. This is somebody's life that you're impacting. And, and I, I, I give, I mean, I'm involved in PD Grimm as, as a board advisor, because quite frankly, it's probably one of the most needed services that I could think of in the education world. We're gonna, we're gonna put that, we're gonna, uh, Capture that and put That's you on a sound bite uh, for you guys. Yeah, yeah, we got to get your uh, <laughs> release for that. Uh, so um, I'll go to audience questions that we have. Uh, so Sheila, uh, what what should we do to increase awareness for community college as an option for students post release that aren't ready for a, a four year college? Um, this is a problem community colleges face <laughs> everywhere. Um, I, you know, I see the question there, there's a little bit of a stereotype and I think that's true. I think some of it is going away. Um, I think the four-year institutions have a role to play here because um, there are some very elite four-year institutions that uh, traditionally were resistant to accepting community college students. I'm seeing that change in most of the Ivies. We're now transferring people to Ivy Leagues, which is great. Um, I think, there's the, the fiscal reality. Um, if you start educating a student inside in a program that is affordable so that when they leave, they can continue in an affordable program, it's important. If you have them in a program that is not affordable and they can't continue when they leave because of that, that's a problem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a message that we struggle with continuously. And I will say in the legislation, it looks like free community college, which would have truly helped people behind the walls, has gone away. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so. uh, thank, yeah. Um, next question. Um, so what are some of the key digital literacy skills that help prepare scholars for personal, academic, and professional success? I could answer that. I could um, jump in on that because uh, I just answered it, it um, in the chat. Um, you'd be amazed how many people, you know, in prison don't even know how to use a computer. And I'm not just talking about the older guys. I mean, there I've met some people younger than me. You know, I'm no spring chicken anymore. But, you know, like some young boys like who did not know how to, you know, they needed help with just basic email or like when we were all getting ready to leave Hope Hall applying for um you know, health insurance, things like that. Like, um, yeah, some people need help with just using a computer. They need help with email and email etiquette, um, creating a resume, navigating job search, um, you know, sites because you know, one of parole's requirements is get a job. And how are most jobs found nowadays online? Um, ju yeah, just how to, how to even use one, like, is, is a start, <laughs> you know, um, and yeah, and, and even like do's and don'ts of social media, you know, because like lots of times, you know, sadly, you know, I can, you know, need both my hands to count and more than both my hands to count how many times Facebook has gotten someone in trouble just from posting, you know, um, questionable images or, you know, or whatnot. So like it, little things like that, you know, for people who have just, you know, never really had access to computers. Yeah. Thank you. Um Maya, um, someone asked about the alumni services. So uh, what, what type of uh, continued involvement in alumni services are available to the students post-graduation? Uh, post so once kids graduate, whether it's um, a career track or a college track, regardless, um, not even, well, the ones who specifically graduate and do want to go to college, I'll start with there, I am with them for their whole entire four years. So I will help them move in. I will help them do their classes. I will help them if they need support on campus. I will help them get acquainted, get to know staff at the campus, and then also gain report with different academic um, advising so that they too know that I am part of their support system. And so if they need help, with any of that, they have my contact and I will do visits with them depending on the kid's situation, if it needs to be every two weeks, every, once a month, then that's what I will do. For those who are want to do career, I go out into the community. If they're like, hey, Miss Maya, I really need help with 
getting my resume done or I'm having trouble getting a job. Can you help me? Can you go with my resume? I will go out into the community and do that with them. Also, before they leave, what I do do also is set them up with a professional portfolio. So they have a resume, they have a professional email, they have all their awards that they won here. Um, all of those things is in this professional portfolio that they can take with them to jobs. And then also just for them to have, to be able to see all of their accomplishments that they've done at the school, but then also knowing that it's important. And so anytime it doesn't stop here with any of our alumni, no matter if they graduated years before I was here, they always are able to call back at the school and then I will be with them. One of our kids actually left here and went over to um, the DC jail and he got out and was released and was like, Ms. Maya, I need you to help me with a resume. And I went out to the community, met with him and now he has a job. Like at Founding Farmers and he works and he works there. So that's what I continue to do to make sure that it doesn't stop when they leave here, when they graduate, that they do have support. Great. So we can continue this conversation for, for hours. Uh, and uh, our goal here was uh, to begin a conversation uh, and that uh, we understand that like discourse is important uh, and at, that on this, uh, in the audience were voters uh, who will be participating in, uh, in state and local elections. In, in this audience are uh, people that have parents that have influence. Uh, in this audience are, uh, are uh, system impacted people, volunteers. We have multiple people here. So this is the beginning of the conversation that you, that, uh, that we should be continuing, uh, not only in our field of prison education, uh, but uh, for uh, those that are influenced policy and where resources go. So we thank you all for uh, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, Marie, can you please put uh, this uh, this uh, the slides back up? So we have uh, three things that we uh, want you all to uh, to do. So we have our, our next uh, webinar is on December second. It's called Changing the System and Communities: How System Impacted People Are Pursuing Systemic Change. So really, this this is about. How are, how are people that are directly harmed, how are they leading the efforts to bring about change, all right? Then next, uh, we have a survey. So as soon as this closes, there's gonna be a survey that comes up. Uh, please give us feedback. And third, uh, uh, like a Pentecostal preacher would ask you, we need you to donate. Uh, so the PD Green Program is a nonprofit organization. Uh, the money that, uh, the, the funds that we get uh, go to direct services. Uh, doing this advocacy and education is something extra. So please donate to help us continue to do this unnecessary uh, enrichment and education work. You can go to the pdgreenprogram.org. Uh, you can give a dollar or you can give 500 or 5,000. Uh, so uh, we like the kind that jingles and the kind that folds. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been in church too much. So uh, thank you all uh, very much. Uh, and um, we will see you all on December 2nd and uh, hit that donate button and complete that survey.